When conducting quantitative research, it's usually best to use a valid and reliable instrument when measuring your variables. This is Dr. Amanda Rackinson Zapku, and in this tutorial, we are going to talk about valid and reliable instruments. Why is it so important to use valid and reliable instruments? Well, the validity and the value of research conclusions are based upon the validity and reliability of the instrumentation chosen for a quantitative research study. There are a number of different types of reliability and validity, and that's what we're going to discuss in this tutorial, as well as how to develop a narrative to talk about valid and, reli valid and reliable instruments in your instrumentation section of your quantitative research proposal. Let's begin by defining validity and reliability. It's important you understand these terms before we talk about them in depth, and especially in relationship to your instrumentation for your research study. Let's begin by defining validity. Validity refers to the accuracy of the measurement results. It's the extent to which the measurement measures, or the instrument measures, what it's supposed to measure. Here you can see I have a picture of a bullseye, and the arrow is right in the center. That kind of represents validity. That's what we're going for. We want our measurements to hit the bullseye in terms of what it's measuring. Let's take for an example a math test. Let's say that a teacher created a math test aimed at measuring fraction competency. This specific test only has questions about fractions and not multiplication. This is important because if it had questions about multiplication, it probably wouldn't be a very valid instrument. Then there's reliability. Reliability refers to the consistency of the measurement. In other words, does the instrument consistently measure the variable or construct it is intended to measure? Here you see another picture of a bullseye with multiple arrows, and the arrows are all sort of hitting around the same spot. That's what we want the test to do if it's reliable. We want it to sort of hit around the same spot. If we're looking at internal uh, reliability of an instrument, we want all the items to be similar to one another or relate to one another. Now that we've defined reliability and validity, let's talk about choosing an instrument to measure variables in a study. Now, Kasdan in 2003 said that there are three important key characteristics related to validity and reliability that are important to consider when selecting an instrument. There's construct validity you need to consider, there's psychometric characteristics, as well as me measurement sensitivity. When I say construct validity, or when Kasdan said construct validity, what he meant was the extent to which an instrument measures the construct of interest. So if I'm interested in, let's say, the construct of joy, I make sure that I want a instrument that actually measure, measures joy. Next, there's psychometric characteristics. This refers to the reliability and the validity of the instrument. For example, as we just talked about, how consistent is the measure and does the measure assess the construct that it's intended to, to assess? So does the, con does the measurement have good reliability and good validity? And then finally, measurement sensitivity. This is the idea that the measurement is sensitive to any change that may occur. So for example, if I wanna measure community in the online classroom, and I want to do an intervention to affect community, I want to make sure that the instrument that I choose to measure community is sensitive to change in community be, uh, after the intervention is done. Let's take a little bit closer look at these three key characteristics. So first there is construct validity. Remember, this is the extent to which the measurement measures the construct of interest. One example that Kasdan provides is measuring the construct of social support. Social support is a very broad construct and could mean a number of things to the researcher. It could mean support of family, support of friends, both. And when an instrument is located to measure, measure social support, the researcher needs to evaluate whether or not that instrument measures the construct of social support in the manner that he or she conceptualized it for the investigation. So for example, if the researcher identifies a measurement of social support that measures family support, but what the researcher is really interested in is support of friends, 
then that measurement really doesn't have good construct validity. But if the researcher is interested in measuring support of family, and that's what the measurement the measurement measures, then it is it does have good construct validity. I like to illustrate the idea of construct validity using an interaction that I once had with a dissertation student trying to figure out why their dissertation research didn't turn out exactly like they thought it would. Figure, um, and here's sort of how the interaction, uh, interaction went. The graduate student asked, why did I not find significant results since I know that this math remediation treatment that I implemented with these, to the, with these students is helpful? He went on to say, I really made sure that I designed a solid study that considered and controlled for all the major threats to validity that Campbell and Stanley talk about. I responded by asking a question, what math skills did your treatment address? And the student responded very confidently, well, basic math computation skills such as addition, subtraction, multiplication, this is really where the students struggle and why they need remediation. These are really foundational skills that these students often miss out on. I next proceeded to inquire, what assessment did you use to measure your dependent variable? The student sort of looked at me quizzically and said, well, of course, the math achievement test, you know, the standardized test for the state, that's what everybody cares, cares about. And so I asked, what did that measurement assess exactly? And the student applied, well, the areas that students in, in fourth grade are supposed to show competency on. You know, number operation, fractions. The students stopped. Oh. By answering my questions, the student realized that the treatment group didn't appear to improve. There was no, he found no statistically significant difference between his treatment group and his control group because where the, what he intervened on was computation skills and what he measured whether or not students uh, got better at or what he measured were other skills. His instrument that he chose did not have good construct validity. So choosing an instrument that measures what you're aiming to change is very important for construct validity. Kasson also notes that it may be preferable to use multiple measurements in order to improve construct validity in a study. He says that there are namely two reasons for this. Number one, constructs of interest are often multi-dimensional and cannot usually be addressed with simply one measurement. And participant performance may vary based upon the medium of the assessment and thus influence results. So choosing the right instrument and sometimes choosing multiple instruments or measurements can improve construct validity in a study. And it is something that needs to be considered as you're choosing your instrument for your study. Next, Kasdan says, in choosing an instrument to measure a variable in the study, you need to consider the psychometric characteristics of that measurement. That includes the reliability, how consistent is the measure, and the validity. Does the measure and its contents assess the construct? Now, there are multiple types of validity and reliability. I found that most validation studies commonly aim to establish the following types of validity, content validity or face, and or face validity, predictive or concurrent validity, and construct validity. Let's talk about each of these briefly. First, there's content validity. That's the idea of do the items measure the content that they are intended to measure? It's all face validity then is the idea of does the measurement measure what it appears to measure? Content and face validity are usually established through some type of expert validation panel. Then there's predictive or concurrent validity. Do the results correlate to similar results? So for example, if I was to develop some type of personality instrument, I would want the results of my personality instrument to correlate <clears throat> with the results of a major personality instrument, such as the MMPI. 
Next, there is construct validity. And construct validity is the idea of do items measure constructs. This is usually established through something such as a factor analysis or principal component analysis. Um, and usually what you'll find is an instrument has a validation study that's published either in a journal or some other format. Remember psychometric characteristics include not only validity but also reliability. Now there are common types of the reliability also. I, I would probably say I see three most often. Most often I usually see what's called internal consistency or reliability. And that's the consistency of item responses across a construct. Basically, do the items correlate together? This is usually measured by something called Chromebox Alpha. And you typically want a Chromebox Alpha of above a 0.7 or 0.8 for good reliability. And I'll make a quick caveat here. Whenever you collect your data, it is expected usually that you calculate Chromebox Alpha for your data, for your study, so just as an FYI. There are two other types of reliability that you often see reported. There's test, retest reliability, so the idea of stability of a measurement evaluated over time. So if a student takes, let's say, the SAT on Wednesday and then they take it again on Friday, their scores should be similar. And then there's inner rater or observer reliability, and you'll often see the this for like checklist or behavior observation type instruments and this is the degree to which different observers give a consistent rating. So it's important to note that there are all types of reliability and validity that are relevant to measurements that you may choose for your quantitative research proposal. But you do need to consider the psychometric characteristics. And here I'll also note that it's important that measurements that you choose are normed on the population that you plan to study. So for example, if you plan to study children and you identify, let's say, an instrument that measures community, but it's only been validated and used with adults, it doesn't have, may not have, and probably doesn't have good psychometric characteristics for your population of children. So when you consider psychometric characteristics of a measurement, you're considering validity, reliability is also you're asking has it been normed on the population that I'm seeking to study. Finally, Kasdan says that you need to consider measurement sensitivity when you're selecting an instrument to measure a variable. This is the idea that the, sensi that the measure is sensitive enough to detect change. For example, does the measure have a scale that assesses a large range of responses so that once you implement something such as an intervention, then you can detect the change. So now that you understand what key characteristics you need to look for in a measurement, let's talk briefly about how do you identify a valid and reliable instrument for your study. Well, I highly recommend that you use library databases and look for validated instruments. There are often validation articles. The Mental Measurement Yearbook, which is usually located in library databases at universities and colleges, can also be useful in identifying valid and reliable instruments. And I also encourage you, as you read through your literature for your dissertation or for your thesis or for your research proposal, look at the instrumentation sections. What are other researchers using uh, to measure the construct that you're interested in measuring? So you can see there are a variety of different ways that you can identify valid and reliable instruments to measure the variables in your proposed study. So once you've identified how you're going to measure the variable or variables in your study, how do you describe this instrument in your research proposal or plan? Well, let's talk about, there are, let's talk about six different things that you need to include in a narrative about your instrument. For each instrument, you need to identify the instrument with the appropriate citations and identify the variable that it's aimed to measure. You need, in, doing, in doing this, you need to describe the instrument, describe how it measures the construct that you're aiming to measure. I would include a description of its content, the items, the example items, as well as talk about its origin, who created it, when was it created. 
Next, talk about the appropriateness of the instrument. This includes support for why you can use it with your population you selected for your study. If you're studying adults, why is it appropriate for adults? If you're studying for adolescents, why is it appropriate for adolescents? This also includes the selected setting. So if you're administering it online to online students, has it been used with such a population? Is it appropriate to use with, uh, with that population? And as I've already alluded to when I said you're describing the instrument, you, in discussing its appropriateness, you also need to discuss how the instrument conceptualizes the construct in the manner that you conceptualize it for your research. Next, you need to talk about the measurement's psychometric characteristics. So what is its structure? You know, the subscales, the instrument items. What's its validity? So you need to talk about the validity, whether it be content validity, predictive or concurrent validity, or construct validity, and how that was established through previous studies. You also need to talk about its reliability. Is it internally consistent? What have other studies uh, reported Chromebox Alpha for the entire instrument if it has subscales for each subscale. Perhaps talk about test retest reliability or inner rater reliability. So it's important to talk about the psychometric characteristics, both its structure or both its validity and its reliability. Next, you need to talk about the scoring information. So how is the instrument scored? What's the scoring range? Does it range from 0 to 36 or 0 to 70? And what do those scores mean? So does a high score mean, let's say, high community or high happiness or high joy? Does a low score mean low happiness, low community, low joy? What? So explain how to interpret the scores. Next, include permissions. Talk about if you gained permission from a publisher or an author. Include letters from publishers or authors in your appendix. And then finally, talk about the instrumentation process. What tools are you going to use to administer the, the instrument? Are you going to put it online using something like SurveyMonkey or Google Forms or Qualtrics? And what's the process you're going to use to administer it? Is, it, is somebody going to provide information uh, to your population and hand them the test? Or, they going, is it just going to be entered online and then they can take it whenever they want and they're going to receive an email about it. So talk about the instrumentation process as well as the tools that you're going to use. But I will make a quick note here and make sure it's balanced with what you put in your procedure section because you don't want it to be redundant. So this concludes this tutorial. You should now understand the different types of reliability and validity as well as their definitions. And you should understand what goes into a narrative for valid and reliable instruments in your instrumentation section of your quantitative research proposal or plan.